Good afternoon, everybody, or almost afternoon. I guess it depends on what time zone you're in. I see there's still some people loading in, but for the sake of time, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kyle Lockwood. I'm the Regional Preparedness Liaison here in Region 4 with FEMA. Um, welcome to our next entry in the workshops, uh, workshop series using social science to build resilience. Uh, please be aware that we are uh, this workshop is being recorded. You may disconnect if you do not wish to be part of the recording. Um, closed captioning is, is available. Uh, it should be turned on in a second, and you can hit the CC button there at the, um, on the screen to start that. Um, just a few housekeeping things. Um, like I said, this is the second workshop in the series. Uh, we're trying to hold this every, every other month. Our goal is to help better prepare our most vulnerable residents for emergencies and disasters by providing a platform that enables us to learn from social scientists who study human behavior and disasters. Um, certificates for uh, certificates of attendance, I'm sorry, are available at the after each workshop. Um, we'll send out a survey at the end, and you can request us for a certificate through that survey. Um, we hope. We hope you all ask questions during the presentation. Um, please post those in the Q&A box. We will have time at the end uh, to ask our presenters uh, questions if you would like as well. Um, uh, first, I'd like to say thank you to everyone. Um, NOAA, the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant Consortium and the entire planning team for sharing your time and expertise. Um, and, and for this partnership, this workshop series would not exist without you guys. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Ms. Tracy to introduce today's presenters. Great. Thank you, Kyle. We're so happy to have you here with us this afternoon, and it's my pleasure to be able to introduce our speakers. Um, Joseph Trulio Falcone, it works with the Cooperative Institute for Severe and High Impact Weather Research and Operations. There he is right there. Hey, Joseph. Um, it's, he also works with the NOAA National Severe Storms Lab and the National Weather Service Storm Prediction Center. He is um, located in Oklahoma. His research interests include bilingual risk and crisis communication and next generation warning systems. Um, beyond the research landscape, though, Joseph is also a bilingual meteorologist for my radar, and that's a weather application that's assessed by over 50 million users. He leads Spanish language weather stories that reach international audiences. His work has been published and recognized across the entire enterprise, and in 2022, he was named as the recipient of the American Meteorological Society Award for Early Career Professional Achievement, and that was for innovative and extensive collaboration and risk communication for Spanish-speaking communities and, um, and leadership as an exceptional member across multiple AMS boards and committees. So we're so happy to have you here today, Joseph. Um, and then I think I'm going to go ahead and introduce Jane um, real quickly as well, um, and then we'll let you guys get started. So Jane Wynn is also with us today. Um, there's Jane. Hey, Jane. Um, Jane is the branch manager for Boat People SOS Gulf Coast that serves the regions of Alabama and Mississippi. Um, Boat People SOS is a nation's largest Vietnamese American nonprofit organization, and it's devoted to Vietnamese American civic and political activism. She has a background in disaster and emergency management through her years at FEMA. So she um, is not a, um, not a stranger to the things we're talking about today. Through assignments, she connected um, with Boat People SOS, and this is where she found and fostered her passion in advocating and empowering her community. Over the past decade, she has leveraged her personal cultural and linguistic competencies to plan and implement numerous appropriate services and programs to address the needs of the community, including things like disaster care management services, mental health, financial literacy, health awareness and education, community against domestic violence and climate resiliency. She's been working with Boat People SOS locally and nationally in providing direct services and advocating to address social, 
economic and health inequities for the underserved and marginalized Vietnamese communities along the Gulf Coast. So welcome, Joseph. Welcome, Jane. We're so happy to have you with us today. And um, Joseph, I'm going to um, pull up your presentation and we'll start with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time out of your day today to really dig in into uh, one of our fondest passions, and that is to serve the most underserved in everyday contexts. So, you know, uh, I work within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and one of our mission statements is to protect life and property. And we are fond believers that that means all life and, and property, of course, and that weather warnings and anything else that you may end up receiving should be accessible to everyone. And so today, my focus will be a lot more uh, focusing on lang Spanish language initiatives, what we've done from the NOAA angle, how we've found challenges and opportunities as well to expand these services going forward forward and what we've learned so far uh, on the research end and how that can improve the way you reach out to Spanish speakers across the United States. And so I always love to begin this kind of presentation uh, with a story of why this is so critical and why this is so important. Because we can agree that technology has advanced so far, even in the last couple of decades. Our, the way we predict weather systems are, is increasingly getting better. And to this day, however, the way we communicate, it still needs a little bit more improvement, especially when reaching the most underserved. And so I'm, I'm based in Norman, Oklahoma, and I'd actually love to show, share a story with you that just happened down the street here 10 years ago that really showcased the importance of why we do this. So 10 years ago, uh, there was a big tornado outbreak uh, happening in the El Reno, Oklahoma tornado area. There were sirens wailing, uh, of course, as a big tornado was approaching the metro area. And of course, uh, it was something out of concern. People needed to seek shelter immediately. Uh, however, at this time, the only programming that was available was only in English. Everyone, uh, the only Spanish speaking uh, television station had to go seek shelter, and that was the only source of anything outside of English. So at this time, there was a, a Spanish speaking family of seven that went to go seek shelter underneath a storm drain after hearing the sirens. But since they didn't have any additional information, they wanted to go seek shelter uh, for this tornado hazard. Unfortunately, though, uh, there was not only just a tornado warning issued, there was also a flash flood warning, but that was not communicated to this family. And thus, um, after seeking shelter underneath the storm drain, the flood waters actually was the thing that caused this family to perish, and the tornado never, never actually reached their homes. Uh, next slide, please. I would love to introduce to you La, La Familia Cifuentes y Sarat Santos, uh, seven of the nine Spanish speakers that were taken from us uh, on May 31st, 2013, just 10 years ago. This really opened up a national conversation within the National Weather Service about how we should go about addressing this issue. The forecast wasn't the issue. It was the fact that the communities of interest did not receive the intended message. This echoes and has echoed for such a long time. If we go all the way back to when first uh, the first reported death from the National Weather Service was ever documented, we can go all the way back to 1970, where a, a tornado in Lubbock, Texas, caused more than half of the deaths that day were linked to the Spanish-speaking communities of the area. It's been over well 50 years that these language inequities have uh, yet to be uh, that have been documented, but yet to this day, there's not a systemic solution to go forward in providing life-saving information for all. And as I always tell everyone, this is not a matter of if, but when this becomes more consequential in our nation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, because as a matter of fact, even today, just today, as of 2022, or just this last year, the USA currently ranks number five in terms of all Spanish-speaking countries in the world when considering the number of Spanish speakers. So there's more Spanish speakers in the US already than the majority of Latin American countries and other Spanish-speaking countries. And this number is only expected to grow. And uh, next, please. Instituto Cervantes 2022 estimates that by 2060, there will be 119 million Hispanohablantes. And uh, next, please. That represents nearly one in every four Americans. And so this is something that we need to uh, prioritize, not just for Spanish speakers from uh, across the board, as even today, nearly one in four people uh, speak a, a language other than English at home. This is something that we have to continue to invest research and even our outreach efforts to make sure that everyone stays safe. And so today, uh, I'm a social scientist, and I uh, have done a lot of extensive work in this area. And I'd like to share with you some of the insights that we have learned 
learned over the past couple of years of how specifically U.S. Spanish speakers receive, understand, and respond to different weather and climate threats. And eventually, I want to show you kind of how that research did end up resulting in operational changes and even share with you some of the resources that you can use locally to advance multilingual disaster communication. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about U.S. Spanish speakers. It's something very fascinating to me because it's a multifaceted issue. It's not just a matter of simply translating a message and hopefully uh, having a community react. The example that I just showed you with La Familia Sin Fuentes y Sarat Santos is a particular case because, of course, this uh, family spoke Spanish only, but additionally, they came from Guatemala. And depending on where you come from, the United States, you may, or in Latin America or other Spanish-speaking countries, you may experience very different disaster hazards, and as a result, different disaster subcultures or different cultures of emergency preparedness. I was born in Lima, Peru, and growing up there, I experienced a lot of earthquake hazards. You know, my family passed down stories of how they survived very big earthquakes. But to this day, um, when I first moved to the United States, I was completely overwhelmed. I never saw a thunderstorm in my life. And the sky suddenly started exploding and everything was uh, super scary. <laughs> and that's because of my disaster subculture didn't orient me to understand tornado hazards growing up. So that, of course, I'm going to talk a lot about translation today, but let me be very clear that translation Translation is only the first step in engaging these communities, because whenever we're talking about Hispanic and Latino community, we can't say that they're all one monolithic group. Peruvians that experienced earthquake hazards growing up are very different than Puerto Ricans that just recently experienced a life-altering hurricane from people to Argentina that even saw one of the biggest gargantuan hailstones recorded in modern history. And so we have to really consider that. And it's not only that they experience different hazards, but different variations of the language altogether. And next, please. I'd love to introduce you the topic of dialect. It's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, so say you're going up to uh, uh, someone, uh, one of your very close friends to say, hey, how's it going? Let's go set up a picnic together. You know, in English, the word friend is pretty straightforward. But in Spanish, depending on where you're from or how you're raised, your language may be slightly variable. And language is beautiful and diverse, so we have different ways of saying it. Uh, next, please. Just like in the U.S., where we have these debates on whether uh, soda should be Coke or pop, uh, dialects are also very prevalent in Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, for example, whenever you say um, hello, friend, the word friend can mean something completely different on, or on based on where you're from. From compa to Mexico to where we say it in Peru, causa or pata, more informally. One of my favorite ones is Spain, where they say tío, which is technically uncle. I remember when the Spaniard first came up to me and said, hey, tío, I'm like, you're not, I'm not your uncle. What are, what are you talking about? <laughs> And again, language is beautiful and diverse. Um, and so next, please. Uh, however, this could be uh, concerning whenever we're talking about emergencies. And uh, next, please. Because when it comes to even the word thunderstorm, there are different ways to go about saying it. Uh, Puerto Ricans, for example, are raised to know the word tronada. And here in the U.S., we mainly say the word tormenta. And even to this day, there's no official uh, dictionary in English to Spanish for weather and climate terminology. So if we can't even describe the hazard altogether, how can we get people to respond to it? Uh, next, please. And so based on that knowledge, I, I've done a lot of research on uh, terminology and dialects and how culture plays into a lot of this. And being from Norman, we experienced a lot of severe weather. And I worked directly with the Storm Prediction Center to send out, and you might be very familiar with these, the uh, severe weather risk categories on the left-hand side there that you see in English. Uh, these were also recently translated into Spanish. Uh, however, uh, initially, it was not It was di uh, translated directly, meaning that the words were translating and not the meaning. So I want to show you real quick a research study on this to show you how important dialects and the way we communicate is, is important in other languages. Uh, next, please. And so, you know, uh, the fact that the translation was initially set up that way and with no consultation of community partners, there were just different ways in how we were translating the same risk terminology in English into Spanish. Here's one example where a TV station, you could literally tune in into the morning segment and have different terminology than your afternoon segments or when you flipped across each channel, uh, just because there was inconsistencies in how we would communicate risk in other languages because we'd have trouble translating them because there wasn't any standardization or any way of going forward with it. Uh, Next, please. 
And so we talked with linguistic experts uh, that are very familiar with the different dialects of Spanish to test out the different variations to communicate the intended terms in English. And so initially, of course, the official Storm Prediction Center translations were mínimo, leve, elevado, moderado, and alto. And the linguists suggested uh, mínimo, bajo, moderado, alto, and extremo, which translate to minimum, low, moderate, high, and extreme. And we decided to test this with a nationwide sample of U.S. Spanish speakers um, and gave them both of these options to go see whether this was something that um, whether the linguist suggested translations worked a little bit better. And as you can see in this map, it should go from green, yellow, orange, red, and purple. And so in the original translations, people were being a little bit confused with associating these words with different risk categories, because these different words have different contexts. And so in the original SPC translations, level three and level five were getting confused as they were associated with very similar levels of risk. And so we were able to translate it a lot better to communicate that urgency. And thus, uh, depending on where you're from or how you're raised, you're able to understand that message just a little bit better. And that's our goal at the end of the day. And next, please. And so using the same data, we divided it up against different uh, Spanish dialects. And then, of course, across um, uh, different proficiencies as well. And as you can see here, uh, whether you're Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or other origin, uh, you had very similar results in how you were categorizing risk altogether, which really went to go highlight the importance of us to not translate the word of a message, but translate the meaning of it, because that's what we ended up doing. Initially, the original Storm Prediction Center translations were uh, translated directly. That means they grabbed the English version and one directly translated just that word. But when you translate the words, you're missing a lot of the context, very important context that gets people to take protective action. And so as a matter of fact, we decided to work with these linguistic experts, to suggest new terminology that better communicated that urgency and considered all of that all together. And next, please. And as a result of all this, uh, we operationalized uh, after proving that it communicated that uh, consistent level of urgency, and we changed the translations nationwide within the Storm Prediction Center to minimum, low, moderate, high, and extreme in Spanish. And uh, next, please. This was based out of the research that we conducted, of course. And next, please. It can now be seen across all television stations uh, in Spanish and nationwide. It was one of the very first efforts within NOAA to uh, conduct what we say research to operations, where we grabbed a lot of the social science knowledge of how U.S. Spanish spe speakers receive, understand, and respond to information. We applied linguistic studies. We applied cultural studies to really understand how people look at different terminologies. And we, through research, were able to recommend a new set that now is used nationwide to better help communicate risk across broadcast and across our entire Spanish-speaking communities. Of course, we're continuing these efforts, and we're in close contact with the National Weather Service to produce research-driven um, efforts to be able to showcase this risk, introduce this all together, you know, maybe to a Peruvian like me that's never experienced a tornado before, also be able to develop educational graphics. And so these next couple of slides are some of the examples that we've worked on, which you can use today. Um, and so make sure you take a screenshot for this next slide that we'll have here coming up, um, where we've worked in conjunction with the National Weather Service translation teams to produce a lot of educational graphics. Um, and even though you not uh, you might not know as much Spanish, for example, uh, we actually have automated uh, pre-made captions in English and in Spanish, so you can put them side by side. We even made it to where it meets the Facebook character limit and the Twitter character limit, so that it can be as simple as copy and pasting. But I always re uh, recommend that, especially before big events, uh, review these safety recommendations. And in this um, in this hyperlink here, you'll be able to find all of those resources. Uh, from And we have seasonal campaigns. We do it for all different uh, weather hazards all together in English and in Spanish as well. And so you can uh, go ahead and review these because it's always fundamental. And I always emphasize this, that for a multilingual speakers that, uh, and you know, with a good number of them immigrating here to the United States, they might have never experienced the hazard altogether. I always push my Oklahoma friends to do just the same because here we're a little bit more weather savvy when it comes to tornadoes than compared to like California. But I always uh, poke my broadcast partners to always review the fundamentals, even if it may sound repetitive, because especially for the most vulnerable, they might need that review 
you if they've never experienced that hazard altogether. So definitely keep this in your hyperlinks and share these resources as big hazards come on by so that you can review all this information in Spanish. Uh, next, please. There's also, uh, we're also expanding efforts since there's no official English to Spanish dictionary in the United States to be able to go ahead and create one. So here's another link for you. We've worked with the American Meteorological Society directly uh, to just provide existing Spanish language glossaries and dictionaries if you want to take a step further in your multilingual uh, risk communication. Also a very good resource to have bookmarked. Um, and as of actually, as of this last week, we got efforts approved uh, to create an official AMS uh, glossary in English to Spanish to finally have definitions for these terms. And so, of course, that's a multi-year effort, but for now, here are the existing resources. Uh, next, please. Uh, here's actually something that the American Meteorological Society worked hand in hand just this last year as well to advance lightning safety. A lot of good graphics in English and Spanish too, especially for coastal areas like Florida that receive a lot of thunderstorms all the time. We found in 2020 that more than um, that near or half of the people that died as a result of lightning strikes came from Hispanic and Latino communities. And so we did a nationwide effort with different bilingual broadcast meteorologists and made a ton of graphics to expand awareness of a lightning safety hazards. So another good link there for you. And next slide, please. And I'm right at the 15 minute mark. And so I just wanted to thank y'all so much for your time. Uh, you know, I do well, an extensive amount of research in this area. We do uh, annual surveys uh, for the next three years on how Spanish speakers receive, understand, and respond to different weather and climate threats. We're extremely collaborative. And so, you know, if you ever have a question, a curiosity of, hey, how do Spanish speakers respond to hurricane threats? We can add a few questions to that survey and get some information back to you as well. So there's my contact information in my website. There, I have a Spanish risk calm links uh, tab where you can access all of the hyperlinks that I just mentioned, along with um, the up to date research that we're doing in this area to better understand US Spanish speakers. So hopefully uh, you got out of this presentation just some of the fundamental risk communication research being done in this area, even some practical ways uh, you can reach uh, your local US Spanish speaking communities. But with that, thank you so much for your time. I will uh, toss it uh, to Jane here to really expand the notion on Vietnamese communities, and I'm so excited to hear all about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joseph. And if you have questions, you can put those in the Q&A box, um, but we are going to try to save the questions um, for the end. So, um, Jane, you're up. Hello, everyone. I wanted to give a little background um, to who I am, who Vote People is. Um, and before we start with the bridging and language gap in communications with LEP communities and API communities. Uh, next slide. So our Gulf Coast offices um, opened in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in 2006. Our Gulf Coast branch has been providing direct services to the Vietnamese and Asian American population in Mississippi and Alabama for the past 15, 16 years here. Uh, prior to Hurricane Katrina, uh, we did not even know that a Vietnamese community existed along the Gulf Coast. Uh, there were no organizations or agencies um, that were reaching out to the Vietnamese community prior to Katrina. So our organization, however, uh, has been established since 1980s following the Vietnam War, uh, where our founders operated voluntary missions to rescue Vietnamese refugees on boats in the South Asian seas. So these were refugees that were seeking asylum in countries such as Australia, Thailand, and United States. Uh, for the past 43 years, we have continued, um, as well as expanded our services to aid immigrants and refugees and individuals in underserved and marginalized communities globally. Uh, so we have three international offices, one in Thailand, Malaysia, and Taiwan, uh, that concentrate more on human trafficking, labor trafficking, advocacy for human rights. Uh, domestically, we have five national branches uh, that offer direct services and mental health programs, disaster relief, immigration, legal services, community development, and advocacy. Uh, those are within the states of California, Texas, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, with our headquarters in D.C. So that's a little bit about our organization and our background. Uh, next slide, please. 
So before we jump in to how we can bridge language barriers to provide more inclusive and equitable responses in LEP communities or non-native speaking communities, I wanted to go ahead and define what is LEP? What does LEP stand for? So LEP stands for Limited English Proficiency. So Limited English proficiency communities consist of communities of individuals who have limited English proficiency or limited proficiency in the dominant language of their host country. So in our case, English being the prominent language in the U.S., we would consider non-native speakers to be LEP. Uh, so LEP, uh, next slide, please. So LEP in individuals, uh, often face communication barriers and cultural challenges such as severe weather warnings, disaster preparedness, response and aid. So um, as a result, LEP communities experience disparities in accessing and receiving any of this assistance. Uh, so a lot of their challenges would be language barriers, and that can lead to communication gaps between local and government agencies and any kind of emergency response organizations. Um, Limited awareness. LHP communities may have limited awareness of what is even going on if they are sending out live updates um, in only English. Uh, they cannot even be aware of it, and they will not be aware of even the recovery and response efforts when um, they won't know about disaster aid programs and resources due to just language-specific outreach or lack of. And then also there's a fear and mistrust, uh, fear of language related discrimination or mistrust of government agencies can lead some LEP individuals to avoid seeking assistance or even trusting the warnings and communications that are coming from you. Um, Increased vulnerability and health impacts. That's also a LEP challenge. Uh, these individuals will be facing language barriers that may become more vulnerable during uh, severe weather and disasters. They might be unable to kind of articulate or communicate their urgent needs or access timely medical assistance. So this heightened vulnerability can result in delayed um, medical attention or exasperating exasperated health conditions. Um, so that can increase their exposure to risks during disasters and weather. Um, just their access to information and resources, uh, the access to essential disaster related information, um, they may struggle to comprehend public announcements, written materials, emergency results. Um, so this inadequate access to information can impede their preparedness and reduce their capacity to seek help. Um, next slide, please. So how can we bridge this gap? Um, we saw a lot of this in Hurricane Katrina, especially um, in me being on the FEMA aspect of it. I was a local here in South Mississippi when Hurricane Katrina came through. And I can tell you when FEMA came down here, it was a hot mess. There were not interpreters available, no translations available, no resources available in Vietnamese. Um, but FEMA reached out to volunteers, uh, reached out to locals, and we're hiring them on just to be able to assist the Vietnamese community down here. Um, our organization as well was shocked with the amount of the population. Um, so in bridging that gap and kind to fix the wrongs and not having to go back and um, have this happen in future instances, um, I think a lot of bridging gap has to do with communications, a training for cultural competency, and language access. I think that will be one of the most important things in bridging the gap with LEP communities. Next slide, please. So in communications, um, more like alerts and messaging, multilingual alert systems, um, Try to introduce and demonstrate the use of multilingual alert systems that can deliver weather information or weather warnings and alerts in various languages commonly spoken within the community. Um, this kind of highlights the importance of providing those real-time updates in different languages for better preparedness. Um, 
cultural sensitive messaging. Emphasize the significance of crafting culturally sensitive messaging to these communities that considers the diverse backgrounds that of the communities that you're working in, um, as well as their preferences. Uh, next slide. So how do we know uh, what is culturally acceptable, right? So culturally, cultural competency training is an awareness training. It's something that should be provided to any organization, agency, or um, any personnel that will be working in LEP communities. Okay, these educational programs bring awareness to cultural diversity and norms and practices and beliefs of the community. And I believe the primary goal and the success of these trainings, it really equips personnel and participants and individuals with the knowledge and the skills to actively interact and engage with people from different backgrounds. Um, it essentially builds this bridge of respect, right? Um, next slide. So also another way to and I think one of the most important ways to bridge a gap with LEP communities is to provide language access. So this can come in the form of so many different things, language specific hotlines and helplines, um, just introducing language specific hotlines to provide weather related information and assistance in multiple languages. Um, on-site interpreters and trans, uh, translators during severe weather events or even preparedness, bringing bilingual staff and crew that speaks the language of the people. And I believe Joseph had brought this up. Um, the language support can facilitate so much effective communication and understanding between responders and the individuals in these communities, especially if the communities may speak the same language, but different dialects. Um, Joseph went on about the differences, and there is also a lot of differences with the Vietnamese community as well. Um, Chan, Chan can either mean a lemon or a blanket. You could have um, hurricane victims asking for blankets, and if you bring in the wrong interpreter, they would be bringing them lemons. You know, there, there's just a big difference there. Um, so that just comes from being able to have reliable bilingual interpreters um, and uh, that speaks their language. Um, language accessible shelters, right, where bilingual interpreters or signage or even resources in their language are available. Um, multilingual preparedness resources. So let's create and provide access to multiple disasters or severe weather preparedness resources, kind of including brochures and infographs for a lot of um, the LEP community. They have limited education. So infographs really help where there's imaging for them, right? Because a lot of them may have first to second grade education um, or even videos. This can kind of equip LEP um, communities with the essential information in their native language or something visual that they can see. Um, but when you're bringing in interpreters and translators, a lot of people and a lot of agencies kind of cut short on this and understand Understandably, it can get expensive in budgeting, but you know, bringing in reliable interpreters versus the use of Google Translate can, you know, be a world a difference. Uh, like Joseph, piggyback on what Joseph said, Google Translate, you can always translate a word for word, but you lose the context, you may lose the meaning, and it may ultimately mean a completely different thing. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, promoting inclusive um, and equitable response, recovery and resilience um, during severe weather alerts, weather warnings and disasters. Um, importantly, how to do it uh, is collaborating with community-based organizations, government agencies and NGOs working together and inclusive planning committees. Um, including representatives from communities on disaster planning committees to ensure that their perspectives, their needs are adequately considered in emergency plans. Um, 
partnering with trusted local community-based organizations or their ethnic media outlets to effectively reach and engage API populations. These organizations and stakeholders in the community have already built in that, have that built-in trust with their communities. So that will help assist you um, and assist them to be more trusting of you and the messages and communications that you are trying to bring. Uh, community outreach events, uh, organizing community outreach for preparedness or workshops to educate the API and LEP communities prior to severe weather or disasters. Um, it can uh, it can help develop and form relationships for you with these communities prior to those issues coming up. Um, in the end, I think by implementing some of these strategies and emergency management and severe weather. Uh, can kind of break the language barrier and create more inclusive uh, disaster communication approaches and address, we'll be able to address the needs of the LAP communities effectively. Um, but that's all that I have today. I just want to kind of address that promoting inclusive, equitable response and recovery and resilience is so important. It's so important to involve the community, know the community that you're working in um, before you go there. Um, and that's about all I have for today. Next slide. And if you guys would like to reach out to us, my email address is um, there. I've also provided the link to our organization. If you'd like to learn a little bit more or if you're working in different states and regions, we all have the contacts available to you. Um, Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, it looks like we're having a little technical difficulty right now. Um, but if you have uh, questions for our, our two panelists or any of us, uh, please throw those in the chat. We do have a bit of time to answer those uh, right now. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Q&A box, not the chat. Sorry about that. Um, right now, I'm not really seeing anything in the Q&A box. Um, I did see one from uh, Miss Tracy says, are there certain cultural competency trainings the speakers would recommend? I don't know if you guys want to tackle that real quick. Oh, sorry, got slightly disconnected. Um, yes, BPSOS provides cultural competency training throughout the year. Um, we do post the cultural competency trainings on our website, um, and we make that available in a majority of the states that we have our branches in. Um, if you'd like more information on them, though, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. Um, we Speakers usually um, vary throughout the branches. We usually use the ones that um, are near the areas where our branches are. I would just echo what Jane said. She's definitely the expert on, on that. And so, yeah, that's, I would just want to endorse the cultural competency trainings are so, so important and helping really contextualize and really understand your communities and how to best approach them. Because a lot of the times, you know, a, a lot you may be a little bit well-intentioned, but culturally things do get lost. And so it's always important to, before even reaching out to a community to really um, take those sorts of trainings, to really uh, challenge yourself to understand it. And so you could be a better communicator overall. That's all I have. Do you have another question for you guys? It says, um, do you know how often 
the Census Bureau database update updated to reflect language-based populations. I know the census is updated every 10 years, but might be smaller or might be smaller updates. Uh, yes, I would love to chime in on this one. Uh, thanks, Wendy, for that question. Um, yes, so th uh, the census does provide um, language information. Actually, nearly every year do the yearly uh, US Census American Community Surveys. And so that's that's where I use to like base my surveys out of to analyze Spanish speaking communities. And so I definitely recommend the American community as a survey there because they the ACS is so, so important. You can do it in one year or five year. I usually use five years so that it better reflects the spread over Spanish speakers more specifically, but it does provide general information about other about all the other groups. Um, do take, I always like to caution against like census data, of course, is very, very useful in that it can give you a very broad sample of how communities or where communities stand, how big they are and that sort of thing. As something that census data might be a little bit more challenging to dispute is of course, like there has been a lot of undercounting where they was admitted by the US Census Bureau in the past, um, and especially in the decennial survey this past year that they undercounted underserved populations by a lot. So always take the data with a grain of salt, but it's a very useful um, resource to have to just get a big picture idea of everything. So definitely the ACS. Okay, got a couple more here. Um, the speaker mentioned not being aware of the community after the hurricane. How can we find communities, especially when there is distrust of government agencies? I think this one's kind of aimed more at uh, what Jane was talking about. Um, I think going into the communities um, that you're going to work in, Look for the nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations, find the stakeholders in the community. I think if um, you go out into communities prior to these events occurring um, and getting to know them, that's how you would find your population um, of who you're working with. And um, basically, yeah, do your research to uh, know the population that you're working with. Okay. Uh, one more from uh, Melissa. Uh, do you have any recommendations on where to find translating services for written fact sheets, videos, or anything else? I, I can very well begin with the um, oh, with uh, the uh, link I provided on my presentation on the weather service links for other weather hazards. If you visit my website to under the Spanish risk comp links, I have other things too, like one stop shop for hurricane information in Spanish. Uh, another place is actually the FEMA disaster preparedness in Espanol uh, page. They went ahead and translated the ready.gov stuff into Spanish. And so that's been particularly useful as well. And so there are a lot of handouts uh, on the weather service link that I provided on, in, in my presentation and also in the in, in the FEMA ready.gov that you can find on, on my website. But if you're ever curious about uh, about all that, uh, also feel free to shoot me an email. Always happy to just forward you the resources head on. Um, as an API languages, there's over 200 different languages and dialects in the API communities. Um, what I would suggest in finding um, in language or bilingual materials for the communities and the population that you are working in um, would be to find high populated Asian areas. If you're working in a smaller Asian population um, where this material is not available, if you look into high populated Asian um, areas, their states and local cities will usually provide or have that in, in language material uh, for weather updates, severe weather alerts, or um, weather preparedness, hurricane preparedness that you can work off of. Um, I would also suggest having interpreters or um, bilingual individuals on your team that would be capable of um, translating the documents that are already on hand in English. Um, 
a lot of uh, the documents that we have found generally have been Google translated to where we have had to reach out to agencies and organizations within the state to have it corrected, or we would, you know, um, direct translate it ourselves and provide it to our communities. But I have found um, going and just searching areas with larger Asian populations and kind of pulling their information and working off of it helps. Melissa says, thank you. Um, I have another question here it says, let's say I find a population and there's a definite language barrier. What would you say are the first steps in the process for engaging and offering help to these communities, especially in the aftermath of a disaster? I, I can chime in a, a little bit there. You know, I, I completely understand that it, it can be very overwhelming. Like, where do you even begin? Uh, especially I would always reach out to trusted community partners. You know, we have to acknowledge even, even when, as I work here across NOAA and even through the university level, uh, as Jane so eloquently mentioned, there's a lot of distrust, uh, especially when limited English proficient communities um, for like, if I just went up with my NOAA logo and just said, hey, I'm here to help, it might be a little bit confusing. And especially for US Spanish speaking communities, for example, FEMA is under the Department of Homeland Security, which is also the home to ICE and where that has caused family separation within the community, always important to acknowledge. So always going to community partners first, uh, you know, whenever we did some field work uh, for um, the December 10 to 11 tornado outbreak in, in Arkansas and Kentucky and Tennessee, we first visited uh, the Hispanic centers there where uh, they were the trusted community leaders and we relayed the information to them. And since the community, especially Spanish speaking communities rely a lot on social networks, they often look to these people. They give them, you know, legal advice, medical advice, now even weather advice. And so we gave them the pamphlets and brochures and they were able to distribute it out to a good chunk of the community because they, they know one another, they talk to each other a lot. Um, so definitely uh, keep in touch with the, find your local community organization. If there is none, another good place to look at are the local churches of the area, especially ones that are, of Spanish, uh, half Spanish services. They are tight knit communities that help each other out in those uh, kind of ways. And if you have a bilingual broadcast meteorologist in, in your area, always a good person to even meet. Um, so I know, especially along coastal areas, especially in Florida, there's a ton of bilingual meteorologists. So look up your local Telemundo or Univision station, maybe the radio station, where there might be somebody that gives information out in Spanish. And they're often the most trusted sources in Spanish speaking communities because they allow, they're kind of a gateway to to the, the broader community, especially when you don't know English as much, they provide all this information to you. So often people uh, that they can count on. Um, so that's what I have on the Spanish language perspective. Um, I would say the same for the API uh, LAP communities. Um, during Hurricane Katrina, that's almost exactly what FEMA did. Um, we had no DAEs that were Vietnamese speaking, no DAEs that were bilingual. Um, so first step was to reach out to the faith-based organizations because there was no community-based organizations in the area that served the Vietnamese community. Uh, Boat People SOS were the first boots on the ground, the first Vietnamese organization, and we continue to be the only Vietnamese organization or API organization in the state of Mississippi since Hurricane Katrina. Um, but reaching out to the faith-based organizations, if there are no CBOs available, um, that is where they will congregate. That's who they trust. That's who you reach out. And amongst them, you will be able to most likely find someone that's bilingual or that could assist you um, in conducting outreach and assisting the LAP community there. I don't have any other questions uh, right now in the Q&A box. Is there anyone, anybody, we have time for a couple more. Any last minute questions, anybody? Uh, 
All right, I think that's going to be it for questions today. I do want to say thank you to every, uh, both both Joseph and Jane, our presenters today, and Miss Tracy with um, uh, the Mississippi Alabama Sea Grant. And I will take this moment to um, share our next workshop, which will be in I think not this month, or I'm sorry. Not next month, but the following. It'll be in September, and it will be on uh, improving tornado warning communications for the deaf, hard of hearing, blind, and visually impaired communities. So please join us for that, guys. We would really appreciate that. Um, if you have any other questions, we'll put up the FEMA email is there as well. Um, Joseph, Jane, Miss Tracy, if you guys have anything else to add. Just wanted to thank everyone uh, for their time and attention today. And, you know, you, just being here is the first step to uh, to really show interest, to reach out to these groups. And we're, we're always here to help. Uh, so feel free to reach out if you ever have any specific questions and look on your endeavors. You're really doing amazing work out there and making sure that everyone receives life-saving information. So thank you so much for that. Yes, I just want to say thank you also. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to you guys um, and just kind of educate you on how to reach out to our community. So we're very grateful and thankful for your interest and for your time.